Welcome. My name is Gary Gordon, and I'm the founder and president of What Should I Be? And we are here today with Amrit Graywell from Australia, who is a psychologist. And we're uh, going to talk about how she got started in this field, why she got started in this field, and let her tell you her story um, in case this is something that you might consider wanting to do. Um, the requirements and, uh, you know, uh, the work that's required to become a psychologist, I'm sure, are different in Australia than they are in other parts of the world, including the U.S. Because um, I know here in the U.S., uh, to become a psychologist, you uh, it requires something called a doctoral, doctorate degree. And I noticed when you are, when I was looking over your information that that wasn't a requirement. So uh, I thought this was very interesting, the fact that it didn't require that there. And I'm sure in other parts of the world, similarly, it could be very, very different. So um, let me ask you to start taking us back when you were um, either in high school or even maybe before high school at what point did you possibly realize that you had an interest in this, in helping people in this type of way? Um, I think the first time I thought about being a psychologist was actually in my final year of high school. Um, and the reason behind it was, I think up until then, I, I hadn't really even thought about other people's mental health. It was sort of something that was out there. I'd never experienced it. But I, I went to a very competitive girls' school where a lot of girls were struggling with anxiety and depression and also with eating disorders. And I started to be surrounded by it and myself struggling through that last year of high school, started to feel quite anxious too. So um, it just basically sparked my interest in um, the ment in the, the brain and mental health. Um, and I realized that it was something I really enjoyed learning well, about. Were there any classes or any, any, any place for you to get some sort of information on it when you were in high school? Um, not really. My mum um, is a teacher and she was in the welfare area of high school. So she kind of dealt with a lot of mental health issues in the school that she worked in. So she would kind of give me some information and I, I guess I would Google things and um, I bought a couple of books on Freud and um, a whole, whole heap of just bit my own personal research, I guess, to figure out what psychology was about. And when you were in high school, your last year, what like, were you searching for what to do after high school? Is that kind of what made you think about it? Yeah, I, I'd wanted to be a vet for most of my um, most of my life, actually. I love animals. But I did some work experience just before the end of high school in a vet surgery. And I, as much as I loved being around the animals, I hated seeing sick animals. So I knew that was actually not going to be a particularly good um, career option for me. I was really good at math, so a lot of the teachers suggested accounting, but I, I just wasn't really sort of driven by that idea. So I was searching for something in the medical sort of field, um, and psychology just sort of came up. And as soon as I started learning about it, I was just addicted. I loved to read about psychology. I loved to uh, look up different mental health conditions and go on forums and see how people manage their lives with mental illness. Were there um, were there any opportunities for you to get a feel for what it might be like working in the field of psychology before you actually started going for your bachelor's and things to, to kind of, in the same way that you found that you didn't want to do the veterinary work, rather than going through all the years of, you know, getting your psychology and then saying, Oh no, I don't want to do this either. Yeah. Was there any way, did you get any sort of uh, internships or anything like that? Or did you work with anybody? Um, no, not at that point. So I went into the bachelor's degree kind of a little bit blind in terms of exactly what psychologists do. And, and that was a bit of a shock because the bachelor's degree um, doesn't just cover mental illness. It covers a whole range of different um, areas of psychology. And so um, I think that that put off quite a few people in my course. Um, but I just still found I, I enjoyed it. And it wasn't until um, probably the last year of my bachelor's degree that I started to um, get training in being a telephone counsellor and then um, also did some volunteer work with the Salvation Army. So that was probably my first-hand experience at sort of counselling or at least working with people with mental health issues. How did you end up uh, getting that connection to the uh, Salvation Army to get that experience? 
Uh, well, actually, again, it was through just searching on the internet. I, I knew that I wanted to have some experience. To get into a master's program in Australia, you, you need good marks, but you also need to um, have demonstrated, I guess, some um, professional experience, um, if possible. So for me, it was uh, it was partly that. It was partly also just wanting to be able to help people. And um, so I basically, I think, went on Google and looked up volunteer opportunities. And I did a certificate in youth work at the Salvos, which um, started me working with them. And uh, how long did you do that work with the Salvation Army? I ended up really enjoying it. So I think I stuck around for, for probably about three years. Um, really? I'd go out on a bus at night time between the hours of 8 and 12 with another friend of mine who was also doing psychology. And we would um, basically prepare hot drinks for um, homeless people and we'd show them how to use the internet. So it was called the internet bus. Um, but a lot of it was just interacting and basically just, just treating them nicely and with respect because a lot of people don't. So, um, and that was great. It was great. We formed connections with all sorts of different people and, and some of them had some fairly serious mental health concerns. So that was my first exposure to, say, someone with schizophrenia or a psychosis. Now, at that point, uh, you probably didn't have a lot of, you know, information about someone with uh different type of men mental illnesses, what did you do to help since you weren't, you know, certified, you didn't have a lot of knowledge or experience, but now you're thrown into a situation where you're trying to help all these people that might have a wide variety of different problems. What did you do when you're out there helping them? What, what, what did you do? Well, I was lucky that I'd actually, just prior to doing the Salvation Army work, I had um, been trained as a telephone counsellor, as a crisis counsellor. Okay. Um, and basically that just taught me the skills of, of basically listening um, and providing support, just a, sort of supportive counselling skills. So whilst I couldn't necessarily change the situation or change the way people thought, um, I had developed the ability to to listen in a compassionate way, um, which would often be a really calming influence and a really affirming influence on the people. And and I think that um, basically that was our role. It was really just to provide some some support. Unfortunately, we couldn't fix a right. lot of their, their situations, um, but we could make their day a little bit brighter. And this was in your pretty much your last year of your four year degree. Yeah, so I I think um it was in the it was in my fourth year that I started to do telephone counselling. I then also took a year off between my my third and fourth year. So the reason for that was I I had basically gone straight from high school into to university, and psychology is quite a competitive area. So I kind of took a year's break to just earn a bit of money and relax my brain a little bit, and then went back in the fourth year. So that was that that year gap was when I did a lot of the the voluntary stuff, or at least started it. Okay, now. Um, when you were in high school, did you tend to do well in certain type of classes, um, that kind of went along with this interest in psychology, you know, like, or were you a math person or, you know, like what type of classes did you tend to excel in? Um, yeah, I think my, my best subjects at high school were maths and science, so biology particularly, which is kind of related to psychology. You do lots of neuropsychology um, and maths is, is uh, invaluable because you do a lot of statistics and psychology. But I was also um, always quite a good writer, um, quite articulate and had the ability to write um, essays as well and also um, write creative writing stories. So I think that's also probably an important skill for psychology because one, writing is a huge part of the degree. There's a lot of research and um, there's a lot of written um, examinations and assessments. Um, and two, I think um, creative writing and reading is probably the way that you get a better understanding of emotions. I guess that's a, a good way of increasing your emotional intelligence because you learn to put yourself in the shoes of characters and um, you learn how different people feel in different situations. So I'd say that that probably was beneficial as well. Okay. Now, what is it about psychology, if you can try to put it into words, that that you love, that that pulls you into it? I think it's, um, it, I mean, really, it's just fascinating to learn about the human mind. I mean, particularly for me, my main interest is um, abnormal psychology or psychopathology. So um, just learning about how the mind can just have so many different variations and people can struggle with things that just seem incomprehensible to, to the rest of us. 
um, there's there's just so many facets of it as well. It never gets boring. You can never know everything. And that can be a bit anxiety provoking sometimes, but it's also um, really exciting as well. Do you, now that you're out of your, you've got your master's, you got your bachelor's, do, is this something, is this field something that you need to continue learning all the time or is it, okay. And, and yeah, in what, yeah, and in yeah, what ways? I, I constantly have my head in a book or, um, constantly looking at, at the latest journals, um, a few ways. I mean, when you work with clients, particularly when you work in sort of a private practice where you, you, you see a lot of different issues, you don't specialize in one particular area. You think you've got a grasp of something and then someone comes in with a new issue that you haven't seen before. So uh, the most recent example of that might be that I, I treat a lot of kids with anxiety and then I had a child come in with what we call trichotillomania, which is pu hair pulling. And I had heard of it, but I had never seen it before. So learning how to treat that meant going back to the literature again, reading um, reading up on the latest treatments, getting an idea of exactly what sort of is behind that condition and what helps with it. So constantly looking at that. Also, um, there's a lot of development still in the area of psychology. I think there always will be. So different types of therapy. So cognitive behavior therapy is the main focus of, of a lot of us at the moment, but there are some new therapies that have been sort of um, developing over the last little while and, and keeping abreast of those can be really helpful because we know therapy isn't an exact science. So the more we can learn, the more strategies and techniques we can try, the better we're going to be able to help our clients. Do have you been able to see since you got into this field? Have you been able to see that you were able to help someone, even if it was just one person so far? But I was just curious, like, have in treating someone, have you been able to see that they had this problem and they worked with me and I worked with them? And over a period of time, I was able to bring them from here to here and they are now better. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I could probably give you numerous stories. It's it's amazing. I mean, not everything is a success, but a large proportion is. And working with kids particularly is that area where you've got a, a lot of room for, for, for I guess, improvement. Um, a lot of the patterns aren't entrenched, so it's a lot easier. So sometimes it could be a matter of six sessions and I see a child who came in, couldn't sleep at night because they've got a, a phobia of the dark and six sessions later they're sleeping in their own bed feeling a lot more confident. Um, so that's probably the easier cases of phobias. But in, even in, in more complex cases, I mean, I, I've worked – um, with some really complex guys. I used to work in a um, male um, correctional facility and um, working with some of the guys, I, I worked with one particular gentleman who for 10 years had been in and out of jail um, because of, of excessive drug use. Um, and the reason that he had not ever sought help for his drug problem was that he had social anxiety. And so by working with him consistently for a long period, um, we have, were able to address that anxiety and he was able to go into a drug and alcohol program and, as far as I'm aware, stay out of jail for longer than he had ever before. Wow, that's – that's because I, I think that's wonderful. So, um, so you were in high school. Your last year, you kind of figured out that psychology was where you wanted to go. You went to a four-year school. You got your degree. Tell me about – what it was like in your first four years of school, how much of it is dedicated to training you in psychology? How much of it was general studies? Because I'm not familiar with what they do in Australia. So I'm just curious as to in that first four years for your bachelor's, how much of the training of that four years is spent on psychology? Is it like only maybe 10 or 20 percent, 30 percent, you know, that type of thing? Well, the bachelor's degree, I mean, it's quite intense um, in terms of psychology. There's so many different fields of psychology that you have to fit into the four years. Um, it's a very theoretical degree. You don't do a lot of, in fact, you don't do any real practical um, training, particularly in Australia. I'm not sure if it's different across the world. Um, so it's a lot of just theories of personality, theories of social psychology, um, neuropsychology, um, learning, cognition, um, you know, you name it. It's a whole whole range of different areas in psychology. You, you've got a bit of room for electives though too. So I got to do a bit of Italian and I did a bit of science as well just to um, explore other interests, I guess. But it, it's fairly, I'd say probably about 80%. Um, of it is psychology and statistics, which comes as it, there's particular statistics subjects for psychology as well. That's great. So after your four years, 
Did uh-huh. you go immediately into your master's? I didn't actually. I again, I wanted um, the opportunity to get some life experience to work a bit. I'd grown up in a fairly sheltered background. I'd lived in the suburbs, in you know, in a nice area, and I think coming in contact with the with the the homeless people with the Salvation Army made me realise I needed to probably live a little bit more before I tried to help people with their problems. So I um, worked for three years in the area of occupational rehabilitation. So that was workers' compensation, basically, and and, uh, managing injuries in the workplace, Um, which was great because it taught me the discipline of working a a nine-to-five or sometimes longer-hour job. Um, Built up some money as well because master's programs are not cheap um, and you can't work during the master's program. Um, So, And also gave me something on my resume in terms of actual work as well. So how long was the master's program? The master's program is two years full-time. You can do it part-time as well, though. Um, But two years full-time, it's two days of class, and you do some placement um, opportunities as well. So it's quite a a heavy load. So after your bachelor's, you ended up working for three years? Yeah. And then you went for your master's for full-time for two years? I did, yes. Okay. And... um, in addition to the masters, do they require any sort of work, like where you work under someone or internships or things like that? Yeah, that's part of the master's program. So initially one day a week and then it um, increases to two or three days a week. Um, you work, first of all, in the university clinic. So we had two um, clinical supervisors in the in the clinic and, um, and as well as the academic staff who would support us through our work there. They kind of throw you in the deep end. You do basically get a client and you start working with them. Um, you videotape or, re- or audio record some of the sessions and your supervisor listens to them. You see the supervisor on a weekly basis. So they kind of say, okay, this is what you can do next session and, and this is what you could improve on. Um, but it is throwing you in the deep end. So um, it's kind of scary, but it's also probably the best way to learn, I think. Cool. Um, now, you're currently doing what? I currently work as a clinical psychologist in um, a child and adolescent practice, private practice. So we, um, as a brand, have two clinics in Sydney. Um, And basically, we provide services for kids anywhere from infancy right up to some young adults. So probably the oldest I'd see is about 21 um, and their family. So I basically work treating or assessing and treating mental health concerns in children and adolescents. Okay. Can you give me an idea, maybe walk me through what it's like to be you, you wake up and, you know, like give me a day, like you wake up like about what time and yeah. you do this, just walk me through what an average day doing what you do is. Sure. Well, because I work in private practice, my hours are quite varied. Um, so it's not a nine to five job. I see a lot of teenage clients. So I work with another psychologist. She tends to specialize in the young kids. So I, I work a lot more with the adolescents. Um, So I'll often do appointments after school. So my busiest time of the day would be about three o'clock to up until sometimes even eight o'clock on certain days in the evening. So the average day would involve probably having a bit of a sleep in because I work a bit later in the day Um, and then usually going into the clinic um, preparing for the day. So I'll look at my client list for the day, um, make sure that I've got a a rough plan in mind of of what we're working on, review the notes from the previous week because you work with quite a large caseload so you can't always remember exactly what happened in the last session. Um, make lots of phone calls. I often have to call schools, have to call, um, if they're in separated families, I'll often have to call the dad or the mum who hasn't attended the session, um, write letters to doctors about my clients. Um, And then as soon as um, my day starts in terms of the clients, it's often back to back for quite a while. Um, So it would just involve seeing a client for about a 50-minute session each hour. And yeah, that's probably my day at the moment. I'd see about four to six, sometimes in a push to seven or eight in a day. Wow. So, okay. So you're working, you're seeing anywhere from four to eight, um, patients in a day. Yeah. We're a very busy practice. Um, and so that's part, part of the reason for that. I think ideally I'd probably prefer to stick around five a day, but, um, you know, we, we don't like to make patients wait for too long, um, to get an appointment. So sometimes we push ourselves a little bit. Now, do you, in, in Australia, do patients typically have to pay out of their pocket to go see a psychologist like yourself? 
Um, they pay a little bit out of their pocket. We're, we're quite lucky here. We have a, a scheme um, under our Medicare, which is sort of the government medical sort of provision um, that provides up to 10 sessions that are partially funded by the government. So um, usually they will have to pay a bit of a gap for the sessions um, and then any more than 10 sessions they will have to pay out of their pocket. And how long does it typically take someone to get to see a psychologist, you know, for an appointment in your, uh, in Sydney? Um, in our practice, um, as we're, we're very committed to not having a long waiting list, probably the longest they'd have to wait might be three weeks. Okay. Most of the time, though, we'll try and fit them in the following week. If they, if they give, a call, give us a call, we'll try and leave a few slots through for new patients. Okay. Um, if you were able to talk to someone that's in high school, and, you know, like let's say a, a high school invited you in to talk about what you do and to help tell these high school kids, you know, your recommendations on maybe what they should do, how quickly they should get started doing something, whether they should start reading books, interning, looking on the Internet. If you had a few minutes to talk to these kids, mm -hmm. imagine you're there. And you want, and you have the ability to reach these kids and and give them some advice from what you've gone through. You've now got your bachelor's, your master's. You're working in a practice, and you want to tell them, look, if if I had been back where you are now, this is what I think. If you have an interest in psychology, you know, this is what you should do. Talk mm -hmm. to me like that. I'd probably say to them that they'd need to. Um, Probably try and source out some voluntary opportunities first up. I think the best way to learn to be a psychologist, I think, is through doing. Um, yeah, we do a lot of reading and, and that is important. Um, but a lot of the, the skills come from actually practicing. So I'd be saying to a young person, um, you go out and, and maybe go to, say, a retirement home and, and talk to, to older people, older adults, you know, learn, practice your listening skills, uh, volunteer at various different organisations that are for the community. That would probably be, be it. A really um, good basis in terms of reading and research um, just familiarizing themselves with um, some of the basic theories of psychology I think would be be helpful as well um, and also I think probably that the, the biggest barrier to most people who want to do psychology is statistics so maybe getting a little bit of early um, an early start on the statistics stuff would probably be good because I know for a lot of my friends that was the sort of area that, that let them down and that was where they either chose to discontinue studying psychology or didn't do as well as they could have. Okay. Is, it, is statistics um, difficult or what might make it easier for someone to get through statistics? Um, look, I, don't, I didn't find it particularly difficult. I think um, probably it's a mental block. I think um, maybe uh, challenging some of those cognitions about it would be important. So hopefully if, if students are learning about cognitive behaviour therapy, they might be able to practice that. I think it, it's, it's mainly a sense that people go, oh, this is horrible, it looks awful, the computer program you have to use is complicated, I can't do it. And, and they build up a frustration when they, they present themselves with it so they avoid it. So I think it's, it's more that it's um, a frustrating subject than that it's a hard subject. And I think if you can tolerate and deal with that frustration, I think anyone can get through it. It's not. It's it's actually not as hard as say math that it is at high school. So um, it's very doable. So maybe they should see a psychologist to help, <laughs> yeah, them, help yeah. get or, over that. You know, or just maybe join a study group. I had a friend who who used to come and study with me, and uh, and she'd say, "Oh, okay. You know, if I look at it in a more positive way, it's actually not so hard." I mean, we our receptionist at our clinic at the moment is also a psychology student, so she'll often say to me, oh, "I don't know how to do this," and and just calming her down and saying, "Okay, let's break it down. Let's look through it," and and she'll often go, "Oh, that wasn't actually so bad." Are there any things that you've um, seen or go through? that you don't like about or or feel not not necessarily don't like but just challenge you uh that you didn't expect that um are involved in being a psychologist that you you know feel uncomfortable with just i'm trying to help show not just maybe the good things that you love but maybe also some of the things about being a psychologist that are maybe not so great 
Sure. Um, you know, I think probably the biggest challenge for me is, is the fact that it's not black and white. It's not exact. Um, it's, it's not like you have a broken leg and you do this. Um, and I think that can be quite anxiety provoking. Um, a lot of people who go into psychology uh, tend to be perfectionistic and to, tend to be... Um, uh, tend to be people who like to achieve good results and sometimes you can't do that um, and sometimes you certainly can't do that quickly. So I think dealing with the uncertainty is certainly a huge challenge. So having someone sitting in front of you and thinking, gosh, I actually don't know what to do and being able to tolerate that is probably the hardest thing for me. I think the other hard thing is is you're dealing with lots of different personalities and sometimes people can push your buttons and particularly when you work with kids, for example, you're dealing with parents um, and most of the time that's fine, but sometimes there will be lots of expectations on you from the client um, or from the client's parents. Um, and and so sometimes different personalities are, are difficult to deal with, definitely, and they um, can put you on edge, you can feel anxious, you can feel frustrated. Um, so I think whenever you're working with people so closely, there's always going to be that, that element to it too. Uh, in terms of other challenges, I, I guess... I don't struggle with this so much, but I think for a lot of psychologists, it's around um, not taking the problems home with you, not letting them impact on on your own personal life as well. I think it's a skill that some of, some people have, and it's something you can develop of just leaving work in the office and coming home and enjoying your, your family time or your free time. Um, and if you can do that, it's fine. But I think some people would probably shy away from psychology because they struggle to do that. Mm. I could see that being a problem for me. You know, just going through and working with people, kids, and seeing problems all day long. And when yeah. I come home, not caring, like, oh, you know, just leaving that behind. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'd be able to put that in a box. It's really hard to do. I mean, my sister, um, she's an academic and she works in um, research around human rights and, and she gets very affected by the stories that she hears and reads sometimes and she, she'll call me and, and want to debrief and say, I don't know how you listen to this stuff every day. Um, and it's almost a bit scary that I have this ability to just, just detach. As soon as I get in the car, I turn on the radio and, and that's it. It's, it's, it's over for the day unless I've got to do a little bit of research. But I certainly I care for my clients when I'm in the room um, and I still care about them when I'm not in the room but I don't allow myself to, to kind of be drifting back to, well, wonder what they're doing and how are they. Um, and it's a bit of an unusual skill to have but it's really necessary, I think, if you, if you want to be able to succeed in psychology. But I could also see the same problem in a lot of other fields as well, like yeah. police or lawyers. You know, if you've got clients that are, you know, in jail and, you know, you want right. to get, you know. So, I mean, I, it's not like being a psychologist, it's, it's exclusively your problem, you know. <laughs> so, it, you know, no. I, I think it's just something, uh, but it's good to be aware of it. You know, that, yeah. that you are going to have to, you're, you are going to be hearing uh, from what I'm hearing from you, or you're, you are going to be hearing of a lot of issues and a lot of problems and seeing troubles and uh, trying to help them. And when you come home, it's just going to, you're going to have to leave it at the door or it's just going to consume you. Exactly. Wow. And it would also depend on which area you work in as well. I think you know, treating, um, say, children with anxiety disorders is probably less um, demanding in that sense because... They're fairly solvable and, and they're often distressing, but they're certainly not, you know, horrendous stories of trauma a lot of the time. I think if you're working hev heavily with trauma or, say, rape victims um, um, or a lot with suicidal clients, I think that would probably take its toll more as well. So do you um, – what type of continuing education now do you find yourself having to, con you know, to work on and attend or do – um, well, there's a basically there's a mandatory requirement to stay registered as a psychologist in Australia that you need to do a certain number of hours of professional development in the year. So uh, that could be online courses, it could be attending workshops or conferences, it can be um, getting together with a group of your colleagues and um, basically seeking advice and support from either a group of colleagues or a senior colleague. Um, I was able to, to go to America last year actually and get trained um, in the Beck Institute in Philadelphia and that was just awesome. That was a, a great experience. So you can kind of, it depends again on your degree of motivation. I like to be 
um, I like to be up to date with all of the um, latest techniques. So I like to kind of go to the source and be trained by the source of um, the people who have developed the therapy. Um, but basically you get by in psychology um, and to keep your registration, you need to definitely attend some courses um, and do ongoing reading. So I guess the key is to have a natural interest in the field. Definitely. I, I just, I can't underscore enough. I don't think it would be fun to be a psychologist if you didn't enjoy it because there's a lot of reading. And I'm not a big reader. I don't enjoy reading much. But when I'm reading about something that's relevant to a client that I see or something that's relevant um, to a general group of clients or a new therapy, I just love it. I can lie in bed on a Friday night and read a book on dialectical behavior therapy and some of my friends will just be just completely confused with how that could be but um you have to live and breathe it and i absolutely do are there any like podcasts or uh things like that where you can li learn from you know like people talking about things like that that you've ever found or listened to Definitely. I mean, I do quite a bit of a commute to and from work, so I've got a lot of podcasts on my iPod and iPhone. Uh, one, one, I think one I came across really recently was on on, an, on acceptance and commitment therapy, which is, um, I guess, one of the new evolving therapies. So, yeah, they had, I think, 12 hours or more of, of talking through all the concepts, which is just so useful. Um, but there are so many podcasts. If you type in therapy or psychology or mental illness, you'll find just huge amounts and, and from some of the leaders in psychology, which is really exciting as well. Because I would think that if you were trying to figure out if this is something you like, listening to people talk about the different fields might be enlightening and informative to you and, you know, maybe, you know, have, even though you might not understand all the terminology that somebody's using, just to hear the, the conversations Definitely. And a lot of the, the good podcasts put in examples as well. There are a lot of clinicians talking about cases that they've dealt with. So um, I guess the other thing about psychology is that it's easily relatable. So um, I think there, there's not a lot of technicality. To, well, I mean, there's technicality to it, but in terms of the podcast, there wouldn't be a lot that, that people would be able to grasp, even if they weren't a psychologist. So I think it would be definitely a really good way to, to learn a little bit more about it. That's great. Um, do you have... Uh anything else that you might like to share again what should i be is all about trying to help educate uh people who are considering you know if they're looking for something to go into before they go into it they want to listen to somebody who's doing it talk about what they do and how they do it how they got started is there anything else that you might like to f share as far as you know to talk to talk to these people I think um, the main thing I think about being a good psychologist is to try and get a, a breadth of experience like through lots of different areas. So I think um, not limiting yourself to one particular area, trying to, to work in a, in a variety of areas to feel out what you actually enjoy doing, I think is probably an important thing. I came into psychology wanting to be a child psychologist, um, and I am, but I also have looked at other paths along the way and kind of explored other areas and found you know other areas that are equally interesting. So I think that's probably part of the process. Um, understanding that doing psychology at university um, can lead to lots of different paths. I mean, I'm a clinical psychologist, but there are forensic psychologists, there are neuropsychologists, um, organizational psychologist. So there's a, a whole varying degree of jobs that can come as a result of doing a psychology degree. So um, it's not a unitary kind of science as well. Um, there's lots of options. I think it's probably an important thing to recognize too. Terrific. Well, I think, uh, I think we wrapped up uh, quite a, quite a good interview as far as talking about you know, your career as a psychologist and, and where you came from up the ladder and how you got to where you are. Um, I thank you very, very much, Amrit. And, uh, you know, I appreciate your time and your uh, donating your time for this. And um, we will post on the, uh, on the interview page for you, uh, you know, any other information that you might want to send us along with some background information that you've already filled out uh, as far as like where you went to school and things like that. Um, I don't know whether or not you want people to be able to follow you, contact you, um, but you can let me know offline. And uh, if sure. we, if we, uh, you know, if you do, we can put contact the information there. 
Um, we can always update it in the future. And um, again, this is 2013 that we're doing this interview with you, and you are in Australia as a clinical psychologist. And uh, again, we thank you very much, and uh, we'll try to keep in touch. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you very much.